As you may have noticed, we live in three-dimensional space. Is this a coincidence or is there a reason? Well, a research in reverse physics suggests it's not a coincidence. We can make an argument for it. And this is what I'm going to present. First, we are going to see that each degree of freedom is two-dimensional. Position and momentum is made by pairs of variables. So if a direction in space forms a degree of freedom, then it has two variables, two angles. Uh, the direction is a point on a unisphere in three-dimensional space. So two-dimensional degree of freedom means three-dimensional space. But then why do we have two-dimensional degrees of freedom? Well, it turns out that if you want a concept of state, of configuration, that is independent of the choice of unit or independent of frame, that is satisfies relativity in this broader sense, then variables have to come in pairs. Mathematically, this is what justifies the symplectic structure, and the two-sphere is the only symplectic sphere. So let's go through this argument and see how it works. So first of all, uh, we note that the degrees of freedom come in pair of variables. We have position and momentum, and so it's two variables that form a degree of freedom. And the other thing that we want to uh, uh, note is that the areas in phase space actually count possible configuration. And uh, this is what it means that position and momentum are conjugate, is that we, if we make a rectangle, the area of the rectangle, so the dx times dpx, counts the possible configuration. And this wouldn't be true, for example, if we would use velocity. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work the same way. So it's key if we have a degree of freedom that we have two variables and that these two variables can be conjugate. The other key thing is that the degrees of freedom have to be independent uh, of each other. What does it mean? If we have two degrees of freedom, like uh, x and px, y and py, a choice on one degree of freedom does not influence the choices that we make on the other degree of freedom. So if we fix uh, y and py, we have uh, all the possible choices between x and px. This is what it means. Uh, at least it's one of the things that we need uh, to say that uh, the degrees of freedom are independent. We Fix one variable, fixing one variable does not fix the other variables. Okay, so this is how it works for a standard degree of freedom. And now we want to talk about directions. And how do we talk about directions in mechanics? Well, angular momentum is uh, the physical quantities that is going to be able to uh, identify directions in space. And so typically we're going to have our vector of angular momentum L with three components, Lx and Y and Z, which we can also write in spherical coordinate as L, the magnitude, times the two angles theta and phi. And here you have a diagram to remind you that uh, the angle theta is taken from the top and the angle phi is taken uh, from this uh, in this direction. Okay? But the thing that we note here is that the direction and the magnitude are independent. That is, if we fix uh, the uh, magnitude, uh, we can change the angle however we want, uh, so fixing the magnitude does not fix uh, the, uh, the angles, it does not fix the direction. And so we can really properly talk about a directional degree of freedom that is independent from everything else, and so the direction forms an independent degree of freedom. However, you're going to note that the two angles theta and phi are not conjugate. And we can see this because if you make these uh, rectangle in uh, d theta and d phi, depending where we are, the area will be different. And the number of configuration has to be given by a patch of area of the sphere. So these two variables, uh, they still chart the degree of freedom, but they're not really conjugate, and so we want to a little bit understand how that works. So the number of possible direction then is going to have to be proportional to the solid angle, which is this uh, d omega. And we can multiply d omega for convenience by the, uh, the angular momentum itself. So we would have that L is going to be sine theta d theta times d phi. And we can take this and put it inside the differential operator, and we would have d of L cos theta d phi, but L cos theta is just the component, uh, the vertical component of the angular momentum. So we, now we have dLz d phi xy. So we have the vertical uh, component and then the angle on the plane that is perpendicular to that component. And so these two now are uh, conjugate. The angle uh, theta uh, 
xy, which would be the angle on this plane, and the component of the vector along the vertical axis are conjugate. And what happens when we do the, the area is that when we are taking the vertical component, now this vertical component will take a little bit more uh, uh, vertical direction on the sphere because the sphere is going to slant, right? And so instead of get, getting this part, you're going to get in this part, and so you get a little bit more surface. So even though the angle, uh, uh, the, the, the slice decreases as we go up, the vertical direction goes up, and so the two things uh, uh, compensate, and so the these two quantities are uh, uh, indeed conjugate. So we have uh, uh, a directional degree of freedom and the directional is charted by two uh, uh, conjugate quantities and uh, since uh, the directions are two-dimensional the space uh, is uh, indeed three-dimensional. So we have these uh, things that we are trying to put together. We saw that if we have independent degrees of freedom, these are, are two-dimensional. And then uh, for the independent directional degree of freedom, we also saw that, saw that this is two-dimensional, and this means that we have a three-dimensional space. And so can we turn this observation into an argument? Can we say, suppose that each independent degree of freedom is two-dimensional? Can we show that then an independent directional degree of freedom has to be two-dimensional and therefore the space has to be three-dimensional? So, suppose now we have a, a direction in multiple dimensions, and a direction can be uh, understood as a point on a hypersphere, right? It's, uh, all the possible unit vectors, you pick one unit vector and that unit vector is a point on the sphere. Or alternatively, you can think it as a vector where it, that it has n components, one for each uh, dimension, and all these components sum to one. It's a normalized vector. And so we assume that this direction is uh, an independent quantity. And now the question is, is it one independent degree of freedom or can it be multiple degrees of freedom? So we said that uh, a degree of freedom is two-dimensional, but we have to show that a direction has to be a single independent degree of freedom and not it could be, because it could be, for example, three independent degrees of freedom and then it would be six-dimensional. And so what we note is because uh, all these quantities uh, are, have to sum to one, whenever you fix uh, one uh, quantity, one component on one direction, you are constraining all the others. In fact, if you put any other component to one here, then all the other components have to be zero. So these components always have to be dependent from each other and you can't break this into independent degrees of freedom. So if uh, the uh, direction form a degree of freedom, then it has to be one independent degree of freedom. It can't be multiple independent degrees of freedom. And mathematically, this uh, is uh, the same argument that is going to tell us that the two-sphere is the only symplectic manifold, except that that's a lot more complicated to follow and it requires a, a lot of other math. And this is actually physically more straightforward to follow and, and more direct. Okay, so we have that if uh, uh, independent degrees of freedom are two-dimensional, then if we have a directional degree of freedom that is dependent from the rest, that must form a single independent degree of freedom. So it must be two-dimensional and therefore space has to be three-dimensional. And now, of course, we're left to justify why is it that we should think that independent degree of freedom should be two-dimensional. Could we have a degrees of freedom made by a single variable or by three variables or five variables? Why, why is it that we have two variables? Why do these variables come in pair? Well, let's go back and look at how these conjugate variables work. So we have position and momentum, and we multiply these between each other, and we get areas, and the areas is going to count how many configurations on that degree of freedom we have. Now, the same thing we saw that we can do in, uh, for directional degree of freedom. We have angle, we have angular momentum, and the product of these two, again, give us the same unit. And this is good because we must have uh, the same units for different uh, degrees of freedom because if we want to be able to sort of uh, uh, transduce uh, some configuration of one degree of freedom to other degree uh, configuration in uh, some other degree of freedom, we want to make this de degree of freedom coupled with each other, then uh, we must be able to count the configuration in a unit that is the same for both. So this, this makes a lot of sense. Now, stepping back a little bit, we can introduce the idea of generalized coordinates. So we have 
one pair of variables, a Q and a P. And a Q has uh, units of Qs. So if it's position, it would be meters. If it's an angle, it could be radians. Uh, it could be an area. It could be whatever variable that we want. It will have some units. And then we saw that the units of configuration has to be the same for everything. And it's going to be joule second. And so the uh, units for P, then it has to be the units for the configuration divided by the units of Q. So note that the units of Q are independent from the units of the configuration, and the units of P are fully determined by the other units. They are the units of the configuration divided by the units of Q. So again, we make this organization, and then uh, in the spirit of reverse physics, we try to see is this how it has to be? Is this a coincidence or does it have to be this way? Do we have an argument for, which, for why this should be the case? Well, let's start with these premises. Units for configuration must be the same for all degrees of freedom. Again, because we must be able to couple degrees of freedom, we must be able to transfer configuration for one degrees of freedom of the other. And so we say that uh, we are going to have some, uh, uh, some value for and some unit for the, for the configuration, which in the in, uh, international system is uh, our joules times seconds, but it could be whatever units that we pick. And then we saw, and we are going to say, that the only the units for Q are independent units. Right? So the P are, de are derived. And so for every degrees of freedom, we have a single independent choice of units, uh, which is uh, what defines essentially the, the frames on the observer. So if we have a three-dimensional space, we have three independent choice of units for the three directions. If we have uh, a, a directional degree of freedom, we have one independent choice for the angle and so on. And then the other thing that we should expect, the units of Q cannot be the same as the units of the configuration. Because Q must be, uh, uh, again, it's a choice. Every observer must be able to choose those units. And uh, if uh, the units of Q would be the same as the unit's configuration, it would mean that there is a special choice of coordinates, a special choice, for example, of space that tells you, ah, those are the correct units because those and only those are the ones that actually chart the possible configuration. So suppose that we have these pre premises, but we do not know how many P's are. So we know that there is one degree of freedom. Each degree of freedom identifies one independent choice of units and all the other units have to be derived either from the, unit, the choice of Q or the choice of the configuration units. How many conjugates, how many P can we have? Okay, so these are the three premises. This is our question. And so let's go and suppose that we don't have any P's so that a degree of freedom is fully defined by the Q. But it's fully defined by the Q, then the units of Q must be the units of configuration. And this violates the first condition, because again, we would have a special frame that is the correct one, the one that uses the true count of configuration while all the others wouldn't work. So that does not work. And now you could say, OK, well, suppose that we have more than one. So suppose that we have two conjugates. We have, uh, you know, position and conjugate momentum one and conjugate momentum two. Well, if this is the case, we can make a unit transformation on the P's that leaves the Q unchanged. So, for example, we could multiply P1 by a constant and we could divide P2 by the same constant. But if this is the case, now it is no longer true that the units of Q are the only independent choice. We could change the units of P1 and have the different units for P2, so we have more than one choice. So given these three premises, then there is only one P for each Q and the degrees of freedom are two dimensional. So that's it. That's the argument. So to recap, we have independent degrees of freedom. So uh, sort of variables that go together and they have one single uh, independent choice of units and they don't uh, fix anything else. So they can, they can stand alone. And we have this uh, more extended principle of relativity that, uh, that we must be able to define uh, the count of configuration, which also means the entropy in a way that it's independent by the choice of units and by the choice of frame. And so with this unit and physical dimension consideration, we 
basically can show that each uh, independent degrees of freedom has to have uh, two variables, that variables have to come in pair, that uh, uh, our manifolds have to have a symplectic structure if they define states and configurations. Then we're going to say, well, now we have uh, uh, directional degrees of freedom, and these are also independent. And if they're independent, they have to form a single independent degrees of freedom. So they have to be charted by two variables, by two angles, because uh, the two sphere is the only symplectic manifold, and therefore we have three special directions. So, could we have a universe where we had the seven directions of space instead of three? Well, if we wanted to have uh, a, a count of states uh, that it's uh, uh, independent of the observer, if we want to have an entropy definition that it's independent of the observer, I really don't think so. I think this is uh, uh, the only way that it can be. These types of arguments are the result of our reverse physics approach for our Assumptions of Physics project that really shows that uh, the laws of physics are a lot more constrained than you would think. Uh, and if you like this type of argument, or if you also want to know more and more details about this particular argument, I leave some uh, uh, pointers for our website and for our Open Ashes book, and I'll also leave a pointer to our channel where we actually try to do open research uh, here on YouTube to find uh, other people that, uh, that like this type of ideas and we want to sort of put them together in a nice way. So thank you for your attention and see you next time.